you got quiet without me having to use my librarian voice. That was really good. Um, good evening. I'd like to welcome you to this lovely setting for what is certain to prove to be a uh, most excellent event this evening. My name is Joanne Lamont. I'm the director of the Sandwich Public Library. If you are a visitor to Sandwich tonight, welcome. Um, again, we are in a lovely um, venue again that is only appropriate uh, for Mr. Philbrick to speak to us at. This is a wonderful collaboration between the Sandwich Public Library and Titcom's Bookshop. Um, when I speak to my colleagues in the library world, they're actually kind of envious that we have this terrific relationship. Um, we have commonalities in that both the library and the bookshop connect readers to great books. We encourage a love of reading and learning for all ages. We inspire people with author visits and great programs. And again, there, you know, it, it's this terrific relationship that you don't see that often. We're non-competitive, we're non-partisan, we don't need to reach across the aisle. There are some people in Washington that could take a lesson from how nice we play together. Um, that's, that's as political as I'm gonna get tonight. Um, I really want to emphasize, though, how privileged um, we feel, particularly as the library, to be working together with TITCOMS on programs like this through the years. We are privileged to be working with them uh, to serve a community of readers, a community of engaged citizens, a community of lifelong learners, a community that embraces literacy. But probably the most important thing I want to say tonight is this is also a celebration. Aside from the fact that we have the most esteemed Nathaniel Philbrick here tonight, it is also a celebration of 50 years of Titcom's Bookshop. So if you all join me. Of course, I, you know, I should mention the library's been around for 126 years, so you've got some a little bit of catching up to do. So without further ado, and with warm birthday wishes, I welcome Vicki Titcomb. Joanne, thank you for that, that nice introduction. And thank you all for coming today. We've been super, super excited about this event. Um, and it's a real pleasure and an honor to be able to introduce Nathaniel Felbrick um, and welcome him back to Sandwich. Nat is um, pretty much bar none my favorite historian. I love his books, I love his writing and his insights. He is a consummate historian and he brings the past to life as very few others can. He unearths uh, new clues, he's a terrier of a researcher and um, looks at things in new ways and with new perspectives. And he takes, it feels like he puts himself into the past and he takes us all there with him through his eyes. And I thank him for that. Um, we know what it feels like to be in a boat, in an open boat in the sea, wondering if we will survive what it's like to experience the excitement and fear of sailors on an expedition to the unknown um, in the vast frontier of the Pacific Ocean. And we're put in the midst of bloody, often bloody struggles as our country grew and fought for independence. And that was the first author that um, the Sandwich Public Library and Titcoms and other groups worked on as Sandwich Reads Together, um, our townwide reading program. And I cannot believe it was in 2005 that he came. But those of us who were there, and I don't know if anybody here was at that, that gathering, yes. Remember, it was something we will never forget. Um, not only his talk, but also the interactions with the students who wrote beautiful poems that were inspired by his work. Now, Matt was born in Boston, he's a sandwich guy, and attended Down and Brown and Duke Universities, loves the sea and sailing, and in 1986 moved to Nantucket with his life, wife, Melissa, and their two children. And there he published two books on Nantucket history, A Way Offshore and Abram's Eyes. And over the past 20 years it's been, he's written some of the most outstanding histories of the American colonial period and early 19th century and um, all have been national bestsellers. It was in 2000 that he published In the Heart of the Sea, The Tragedy of the Whale Ship Essex. And I imagine if I ask for hands of who's read that book, it will be virtually everyone. Um, a huge bestseller and winner of the National Book Award for nonfiction. 
Sea of Glory won, um, I have to list just a few of his awards, but it's only a few of them. Um, now, sea of Glory won the Theodore and Franklin D. Roosevelt Naval History Prize. Mayflower, A Story of Courage, Community, and War was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in History and won the Massachusetts Book Award for Nonfiction. Bunker Hill, A City, A Siege, A Revolution was awarded the New England Book Award for Nonfiction and the New England Society Book Award and more. But today we're here to celebrate two books that I left behind the stage, so just one moment. Yeah, several of his books have been um, uh, written or adapted for children, and this is one, I think this is his first one written specifically for children, but it is com did come from Bunker Hill. It's Ben's Revolution, Benjamin Russell and the Battle of Bunker Hill, and we learn about history, or children would learn about history through, through the eyes of a 12-year-old boy. And very, very exciting that that's out, with the beautiful illustrations by Wendell Minor. And his newest book for adults, that we're celebrating today, Valiant Ambition, George Washington, Benedict Arnold, and the fate of the American Revolution. Um, just because he might not speak up about all the wonderful praise he's gotten, I thought I'd share a little bit of it with you. Um, the New York Review of Books calls Valiant Ambition a suspenseful, richly detailed, and deeply researched book. The Wall Street Journal said, clear and insightful, Valiant Ambition solidifies Philbrick's reputation as America's foremost, one of four, America's foremost practitioners of the narrative nonfiction. From the Washington Post, I love this one. Philbrick wants his readers to experience the terror, the suffering, the adrenaline rush of battle, and he wants us to grit our teeth at the early politicians who, by their pettiness and short-sightedness, shape military events as profoundly as generals and admirals do. Finally, he reveals the emotional and physical cost of war on colonial society, and he succeeds on all fronts. And finally, from Army Magazine, in the final analysis, Valiant Ambition adds to Philbrick's laurels as one of this country's premier historians. His account of the middle years of the American Revolution is a tour de force, popular history at its best. We're so grateful that Nat took time from his busy, busy schedule to come back to Sandwich. We're delighted to welcome him. And please give a warm welcome to Nathaniel Philbrick. Well, thank you. Thank you. It is a true delight to be here. Anywhere I can go by getting on a ferry and getting there, this is my idea of a great place to be. And, and you know, the 50th anniversary of Titcombs, one of the great independent bookstores in the country, Sandwich Library, once again, one of the great libraries anywhere. And in this space, I had never been in this new, new uh, I guess it's relatively no longer that new, but this space here in your town hall is, is just fantastic. So it is, I'm really psyched to be here. And this book, Valiant Ambition, began for me really 31 years ago uh, when I moved to Nantucket Island with my wife, Melissa, and our two kids were then one and four. And I, at that time, I was a sailing journalist. I was an English major in college. Moby Dick was my Bible. I was very excited to be moving to the port of the Pequod. And uh, almost immediately, I became fascinated with the history of, of Nantucket and began to sort of teach myself how to write history. And it was while researching what would become my first work of history, A Way Offshore, a history of Nantucket through the whaling era, that I stumbled a, a, across a source that really set me on the path that would lead to Valiant Ambition. It's Hector St. Jean de Crevecourt's Letters from an American Farmer. It is the single best book about 18th century America uh, that was written in the 18th century. And it's a love letter to America. Crevecourt was from the petty nobility of, of Normandy. Uh, he fought on the side of the French in the French and Indian War through circumstances that are still unclear, ends up a farmer in the Hudson River Valley area, married to a local girl, and he travels all over 
the 13 colonies, even down the Mississippi. Uh, and I was reading letters from an American farmer because three of them are about Nantucket Island. He loved Nantucket. He saw it as kind of an emblem of where these colonies were headed. And for Crevcourt, uh, there was nothing like America. You could come from any, college, any country, any uh, economic background, and if you worked hard enough, you could succeed. Uh, he famously says, what is this American, this new man? And it's, it's, it's just this delightful book, and the tone is ebullient and, and, and optimistic until the final 12th letter. When Crevcourt's, and by the way, Crevcourt means broken heart in French. Uh, when Crevcourt's paradise is destroyed by the outbreak of the American Revolution. Crevcourt had no interest in a revolution. He says, why are we having a revolution? This is the freest, most prosperous place in the world. What is there to rebel against? The uh, Committee of Safety, the, the Patriot Committee of Safety moves in. And uh, with the Declaration of Independence, people are, they can, uh, the loyalty oath is implemented. And Krevkor says, I don't know what, I'm not on any side. I'm just an American who loves this country. Why are you making me do this? Ultimately, he and many of his friends are ha hounded out of what's now Chester, New York, in despair, he ultimately decides to somehow try to get back to France. He and his oldest son make their way to British-occupied New York, where he's a promptly arrested uh, as a suspected American spy. Uh, eventually, they get in a ship. They are, they are shipwrecked on the coast of Ireland, uh, where he is clutching this box of manuscripts. He makes his way to London and publishes letters from an American farmer. After that, gets to France, makes his way to Paris, and it becomes best friends with Benjamin Franklin, who is our <laughs> diplomat. He is embraced by the French as the most knowledgeable Frenchman about America. He rewrites letters from an American farmer from a French perspective, and with the ultimate American independence, he becomes French envoy to America. Thomas Jefferson attends his daughter's wedding. And uh, ultimately, however, Crevcourt's life would be upended once again by the outbreak of the French Revolution. But this was a side of the American Revolution I had never heard about. You know, in, for me in high school, the American Revolution was the story of how a ragtag band of militiamen, citizen farmers, banded together to defeat the mightiest military power on earth and thereby threw off the shackles of British tyranny. What Crevcourt was describing was the opposite. He was describing a self-serving group of rebels who used it as an opportunity to plunder their neighbors, all in the name of patriotism. He described a civil war in which Westchester County, just across the river from where he was, became, was known as the neutral ground. And it was, there was nothing neutral around it. It was, it was the no man's land between British occupied New York and the American army to the north in Peekskill. And, every, and, and the houses there were ravaged by gangs of loyalists who called themselves cowboys and gangs of patriots who called themselves skinners, literally raping and pillaging each other's neighbors. And, you know, this was not the American Revolution I had grown up with. I vowed I had to, had to go there at some point. Well, the book I wrote before Valiant Ambition was Bunker Hill. And in that book, uh, and which also spawned my latest, a kid's book, Ben's Revolution. And this was so much fun. It is so hard to write for little kids because you have to, for someone who's as long-winded as myself, to distill it <laughs> into, um, you know, re understandable prose is, is a, quite a challenge. And then what was great is working, collaborating with Wendell Miner, who is one of the great illustrators in this country. But it was with that book that I was uh, introduced to George Washington. Oh my goodness, this is not the George Washington that stares at us glumly from the one dollar bill, that staid pragmatist that looks like a statue and uh, you know, just seems, it does not even seem human. The Washington of the beginning of the American Revolution, he's in his early 40s. He's red-haired. He's fiery. 
He's very aggressive by temperament. He is not that staid pragmatist he will ultimately become. He, he is not happy with the New Englanders he's inherited for an army. You know, he gives them orders and they say, whoa, wait a minute, we have to discuss whether or not we want to do this before we agree to do that. This is what town meetings do to people. And this drove Washington absolutely insane. And even though he didn't have enough gunpowder, what he wanted to do was attack the British who, had, who were, had occupied Boston, burn the city if necessary, and get the whole thing over. Because there was no way they were going to be able to keep this army together for any length of time. It was an insane proposition because he didn't have the gunpowder. Uh, and almost uh, close to half a dozen times, he would bring this proposal before his council of war. And every time it was voted down unanimously. This was a different kind of Washington. I had to follow him. And I wanted to follow him into that dark middle period that Crevcourt had revealed to me of the revolution. But how to get at that? Who to pair him with? Enter my mother. <laughs> Marianne Dennis Philbrick. Um, she, my mom was a wonderful contrarian. She loved to tell you exactly what she thought, especially if he, she knew you were not going to agree with her. Uh, she, she definitely marched to the beat of her own drummer. She smoked a pipe. And I have to say, as a teenager growing up in Pittsburgh, if we went to a restaurant on a Friday and she lit up with my father, it was like, whoa, man, what, what's going on here? But this was my mom. She, was, she just had a wonderful, she, wonderfully opinionated. And her personal hero was Benedict Arnold. And I would say, Mom, what the heck are you talking about? If, you know, someone calls me Benedict Arnold, that's, you know, that's, that's like a, the, the embodiment of evil if you are an American. She said, no, he, had, he, was, he was our best general and he had his reasons. There is much more to the story than, than you've been taught. And I am here before you tonight to say that my mother, in many ways, had it absolutely right. So thank you, Mom. Now, Valiant Ambition begins in the summer of 1776. The British have been kicked out of Boston uh, when a bookseller by the name of Henry Knox brings cannons down from Fort Ticonderoga and places them on Dorchester Heights and forces Ad uh, General Howe out of Boston. But now, by the summer of 1776, New York is in the sights of the British, and the empire is about to strike back with a vengeance. Washington is, by this point, is dug into Manhattan and to uh, the high ground in Brooklyn as a huge invasionary force of f 400 ships, 40,000 soldiers and sailors. That's more people than in in, in 1776 in the city of Philadelphia, the largest city in America at that time. And they're all, not until World War I would Great Britain mount a bigger invasionary force. And Washington, who, you know, then they have ships. It's Howe once again as general, and his brother, Admiral Howe, Richard Howe, is in charge of the Navy. and and. Manhattan is surrounded by water. It's an island. And with ships, they can move their soldiers. They can go to Brooklyn. They can go to Manhattan. Washington doesn't know where they're going to attack. And in short, the Battle of Long Island does not go well for Washington. He's completely outgeneraled by Howe. He's forced to retreat across the East River to Manhattan, to, to New York in a brilliant retreat, a nighttime retreat, but then he's quickly retreating from New York into the Harlem Heights, and then after losses at, at uh, 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 in white, uh, several losses, he's, his army is first forced to retreat across the breadth of New Jersey, uh, all the way to the other side of the Delaware River in Pennsylvania, where they, and his, he's lost three quarters of his army, it's as low as it can possibly get by the fall of 1776. And what makes it terribly uh, perilous is that by taking New York, the British have a toehold on a quarter of water that extends, there's the Hudson River, and the Hudson River extends to almost direct due north all the way, it's navigable all the way to Albany, 
you go past Albany, you take a little jog to Lake George, you go up Lake George, and after a little jog there, you're at Lake Champlain, a lake of river-like proportions that extends more than 100 miles into Canada. Now, in the early 19th century, there are no roads up there. Uh, there was uh, the only way to transport an army was by water. And so this corridor of water was the, if a Britain could seize control of it and isolate New England from the rest of the colonies, it would be game over for America. Howe had New York. And as Howe was taking New York, yet another British invasionary force, a virtual armada, was coming down from Canada. This was a fleet of, they had two schooners, a three-masted man of war that they had built in a month that was the kind of ship you would see in the open ocean. They had 25 gunboats. They had thousands of soldiers, a large native faction, and they were all headed down Lake Champlain with the intention of taking Fort Ticonderoga at the southern end of Lake Champlain, and if they could take that, take Albany, link up with Howe, it's over. There was one American general in position to attempt to foil the, Brit the Brits in this plan, and his name was Benedict Arnold. He, uh, all that summer, he had been building a fleet, a small fleet of vessels, anything with which to try to, uh, if there was no chance of defeating, but at least delaying this British attack. He had built, they, he had built uh, about 15 vessels, um, a couple of schooners already existed, but he built what were basically big rowboats with sails that could take 80 men, about 80 feet long, equip them with cannons, and, and uh, they had a sail. But, but these are just platforms, basically. And with this ragtag band of vessels, and he didn't have sailors. So three quarters of his men were landlubbers. What was he, how was he going to stop this British armada coming down? Well, Arnold was, an, was a, already a hero in, in America's emerging mythology. When he heard of uh, Lexington and Concord, he was, uh, by that time, he was in uh, New, uh, New Haven. He uh, trained as a pharmacist today, a, um, uh, but had rapidly become a, a trader in, in horses and other goods. He had a small fleet of trading vessels. He regularly uh, would sail down to the West Indies, up to the St. Lawrence. He knew Montreal. He knew Quebec. And uh, when he, as soon as he heard of Lexington and Concord, he realized, my gosh, we that corridor of water. We need to take Fort Ticonderoga. That was his idea. He goes to Boston. He says, you know, give me a commission. I'll go for it. They do it. On the way, he learns that uh, Ethan Allen and the Green Mountain Boys have the same idea. Benedict Arnold and Ethan Allen stri stride side by side together through the entrance to Ticonderoga. Take it. And while the Green Mountain boys get drunk on the British liquor supply, Arnold commandeers a loyalist schooner, sails the full length of Lake Champlain, attacks the British outpost there, destroys all the vessels he can't take, and America has control of Lake Champlain. Arnold did that. But Arnold was a prickly officer, and it wasn't long before he had alienated and angered every other officer on Lake Champlain, and he was, shall we say, reassigned. Uh, <laughs> He, he ended up in Boston, where Washington had just arrived after the Battle of Bunker Hill. Washington was mired in what would become the Siege of Boston, but there were opportunities to the north. The British were caught flat-footed by the outbreak of the Revolution. If, uh, if we could take Montreal and Quebec, we would have Canada before British reinforcements could get there. Well, General Montgomery went up that corridor of water to take Montreal. Washington needed someone to lead a, a small army through the backwoods of Maine and take Quebec. Arnold was his man. He put together a small army that in, in, uh, included Daniel Morgan's, Virgin, Daniel Morgan's Virginia riflemen. A young Aaron Burr was a part of this. I mean, it's, it's just archetypal stuff. They didn't leave till late summer, they, and they had to go up the Penobscot River, not down it, dragging these, these boats that quickly fell apart. It was fall. The river began to freeze. They began to starve. I mean, they were going through nowhere. My wife and I followed Arnold's trail uh, 
through the backwoods of Maine, and as, and as we were approaching Canada, you know, there's nothing. And every now and then we'd come to a crossroad and it would be named Arnold. Apparently he was the last person to have gone on there. <laughs> Eventually, they stagger out of the wilderness and there they are at Quebec with the ramparts. Uh, it's, uh, he teams up with the other army that's taken Montreal and in a snowstorm at the last day of the year, they attack Quebec, but it's unsuccessful. Uh, Montgomery is killed. Arnold is badly injured by a ricocheting musket ball that takes out his left leg and it, it doesn't work, but Arnold is a hero. He is, he is now known as the American Hannibal for that great achievement. And now he is the one in Lake Champlain with those 15 vessels he's carved out of the wilderness up against this trained professional British Navy. He knows that if he meets them in the midst of Lake Champlain, that he'll, they'll get blown out of water. He has an idea. On the west bank of the Lake Champlain, just below what's now Plattsburgh, New York, is an island called Valcour Island that creates a small bay inside it. He hides his fleet inside Valcour Bay. He knows it'll be a northerly breeze that blows the British down. He lets, he, sure enough, here they come. He lets them sail past Valcour Island. Once they're two miles below it, he comes out and says, hey, here we are. Come get us. The British say, aha, we have them trapped. They're trapped in that little bay. Little do they know that Arnold is the one who has constructed the trap. Because what he knows is they now have to sail against the wind. And that great big man of war that they had built, his square-rigged vessel, cannot sail effectively upwind. Nor can even the schooners when it comes down to it. Oh, the only ves British vessels that are able to come up to Arnold are the gunships, these 25-foot vessels with a cannon on the bow. And what Arnold has succeeded in doing is eliminating the British advantage. And so with his vessels lined up across the mouth of Valcour Bay, and with the British gunships lined up 200 yards below him, they begin to blast away at each other for four hours. Arnold is in the, the bow of the centered vessel, personally manning the cannon. They, they, they blast away till nightfall. Incredibly, Arnold has fought these guys to a draw, but the British are smiling, smug smiles of self-satisfaction uh, because they've got Arnold trapped in the bay. There's no way he can get out. And so they bring their fleet up that night and they wait till morning and then they're going to seize the American fleet. Well, Arnold being Arnold. See, with Arnold it was hard to say he loved risk. He reveled in risk. And it was hard to say whether that risk, he loved risk because it was good for his country or because it burnished his reputation as a swashbuckling hero. And his, the, the, his second in command says, okay, what do we do? You know, what do, what do we do? Arnold says, we're going to sail through them. He says, what the heck are you talking about? He said, look, we've been firing cannons for four hours. None of us can hear a thing. <laughs> One of our ships is burning at the end of Valcour Island. You know, this huge bonfire means it's very hard to see anything, any distance beyond that. I saw some space between the inmost British ship and the trees. We're going to go one vessel at a time through that gap, and when they wake up in the morning, we'll be gone. They go, okay, here we go. He pulls it off. The British wake up that morning, the mist clears, they realize they're guarding an empty bay. They look over their shoulders and seven miles to the south is Arnold on his way to Fort Ticonderoga. A race ensues, uh, the, the wind now out of the south, it comes in again from the north and the British have caught up to Arnold. Arnold sends uh, his, what, uh, the remaining ships on to Fort Ticonderoga while he conducts a virtual last stand uh, against that big, great big square-rigged warship and the two schooners. Pretty soon his vessel is so full of cannonball holes that it's sinking underneath him. He tells his men to drive it onto the Vermont shore. It's still called today Arnold Bay. Uh, they, they get the men out of the ship, they get it into the high ground and with the, 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 um, the, their uh, battle flag still bravely waving, he orders them to blow up the magazine, which blows up in the faces of the British. He leads his men that night down the, the, the 
edge of the Lake Champlain, and at 4 a.m. they stagger into Fort Ticonderoga. As his commanding officer, Horatio Gates, will write to Philip Schuyler, the, 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 the general, there, no American officer has had more hairbreadth escapes than Arnold. The meanwhile, the British go, what the heck was that? I mean, what was that? If we're going to receive this kind of resistance, what are we going to do? Very cautiously, they make their way down to Fort Ticonderoga. They think about it. Well, you know, it's getting kind of late. By now, it's late October. Lake Champlain begins to freeze in November. Maybe we should, let's delay till next year. Let's do that. Arnold has done it. He has saved America in 1776. The British retreat back into Canada and will not try this again until the next year, and that will res result in the greatest victory of them all, the Battle of Saratoga. In the meantime, now, so Valiant Ambition begins with Washington, the, the person uh, fated to become the one person capable of holding America together at his absolute lowest moment, and Arnold, the man fated to determine that it is his fate to pull this country apart at his absolute highest. And we watch as what happens in the next four years as their careers take very different trajectories. Now, you know, I always assumed Washington had uh, enough trouble fighting the British. What it turns out is he had to dedicate as much time, if not more, to dealing not only with um, his own officers, but the U.S. Congress. Uh, you know, you, th you thought, you'd, you know, it's the, he's, it's the fall of 1776. He's in this terrible retreat across New Jersey. Uh, men are deserting right and left. He gets a letter uh, from Charles Lee, the second ranking American general in the American army, addressed to Washington's aide-de-camp Joseph Reed, a young Philadelphia attorney. Reed is away from uh, headquarters, so Washington, as usual, opens the letter and discovers that Reed has been in correspondence with Lee, complaining about Washington's indecisiveness and suggesting that come the winter, Lee lead a new rejuvenated army that may be able to restore our, 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 the momentum in our, the proper direction. Washington discovers that the man upon his aid, you know, his, his adjutant general, the man upon whom he depends the most, is scheming behind his back. And this is when I, I learned that Washington was an okay general, but he was an absolutely brilliant politician. He knew how to handle people. What does he do? He reseals the letter, writes an accompanying note. This came for you while you were away from headquarters. Assuming it was official business, I opened it as usual. Discovering it was something else, I return it to you with my apologies. George Washington. <laughs> he leaves Reed to twist in the empty, icy, icy emptiness of his withheld wrath. Reed got the message. Okay, and then it's, it's, it's Christmas, Christmas Day. You know, we're, it's all about to fall apart. Washington has this desperate hope that if he can cross the Delaware River and de defeat the Hessians in Trenton, you know, and the Hessians are trained professional soldiers, if he can do this, maybe he can, you know, reverse things. Come on. How's that going to work? The weather's horrible. It's blowing a hurricane, except for the fact that it's December and there's, there's virtual icebergs and coming down the Delaware River. And that night, he's, you know, they're about to head out when he gets a letter from Horatio Gates. Now, Horatio Gates was uh, Arnold's commanding officer on Lake Champlain. Uh, he, he and Arnold had come back, because of Arnold, Arnold was able to turn back the British, that freed them up, and they came down to uh, the Delaware River with uh, 500 soldiers that were very helpful to Washington, were now a part of his army, and Washington was hopeful that Horatio Gates would accompany him on this desperate attempt to reverse the momentum of the war. By that time, he had decided the British had occupied New Newport. He needed a general to attempt to retake that city. That's where he sent Arnold. And Horatio Gates says, you know, I don't feel too good. I don't think I can do that. I'm going to go to Philadelphia for medical attention. And that night, as he's about to get on his horse, 
Washington is about to get on his horse and ride to the ferry, ferry landing, he gets a letter from Horatio Gates. By this time, Charles Lee this has been captured by the British, making Horatio Gates the second ranking American officer in the, in the American army. And by this time, the um, Congress is so fearful that the British are going to take Philadelphia, they've moved to Baltimore. Gates says, you know, I don't feel too well, but I think I'm going to go to Baltimore. What Washington realizes is that his second, you know, the second ranking American officer is positioning himself to take over the army in the inevitable circumstance that he suffers a defeat at Trenton. You know, and this is what he, he has to deal with. He goes across, he has an incredible success, not once but twice in their two battles at Trenton, and then another victory at, at um, Princeton. He does it. He turns the thing around. Now you think, you might think this would get him some credit uh, from the Continental Congress. Abs actually, just the opposite. The Continental Congress was deeply suspicious of Washington or any military leader. Because if you looked at the history of the world, every, every revolution in which a republic was the intended result had failed. Caesar had, had uh, named himself a dictator of Rome. Uh, Cromwell had done the same thing uh, in the English Revolution. Napoleon would do the same thing in the French Revolution. And so Congress was very concerned that in the chaos, inevitable chaos of a revolution where people would get more and more upset with the civil government's inability to work effectively, that Washington would do what had always happened, conduct a military coup. And so they kept him on a very tight leash. And one of the things that they determined in the winter of 1777, and they were very, you know, after Trenton, they were fearful that Washington was now the man of America. And John Adams feared that he was, status was becoming dangerously monarchical. They would, had to keep a lid on it. And so they determined, Congress in its wisdom determined that winter that they would appoint Washington's major generals and they would have a quota system by which each state had two major generals. Now, in, in the winter of 1777, Benedict Arnold was the top-ranking brigadier general, and he had, by bar none, the best record of anyone. He assumed he was up for promotion. But you know what? Connecticut already had two major generals. So the Continental Congress, in its wisdom, decided to overlook to not give Arnold his, his, his uh, promotion and elevate five brigadier generals below him past him to major general. When Washington heard of this, he, he couldn't believe it, you know, because this was all news to him. He immediately wrote Arnold, don't do anything hasty now, let me look into this. Arnold, to his credit, he was angry, he was very deeply hurt. And, uh, but he didn't quit. Others would, in the similar situation would quit. Arnold hung in there, but this began his, his questioning of why am I doing this? You know, why, why, you know I've given everything. He, had, he, he was quite a wealthy man when the revolution broke out. Most of that money was lost in Canada when he, he used his personal wealth to support the army. And Congress was showing no interest in, in re, in, in repaying that. And so that began the process of, of wondering what to do. Fast forward a year. The, the battle that had been prepared for by Arnold's brilliant performance at Valcour Island results in the, in the Battle of Saratoga. It's actually two battles. Arnold was, was there with Horatio Gates as his commanding officer. Gates was a uh, was a, a defensive-minded general who had never led a large army in battle, and he was suspicious that Arnold would steal his glory. In the first battle of Saratoga, the battle of, of Freeman's farm, it's Arnold's soldiers that deliver a devastating blow to the British. Horatio Gates chooses not to mention Arnold in his official report of the battle. Gates knew Ar Arnold pretty well and he knew exactly what buttons to push. Soon they were in a violent argument, and Arnold's was a passionate man. He could not control his, you know, he was on all the time. And they have this violent argument, and Gates throws him out of the Northern Army. He says, go south, help out Washington. Uh, the British by this time are knocking on the door to Philadelphia, and Washington is suffering defeat after defeat, as they will ultimately take Philadelphia. So go help him. 
Arnold, uh, to his credit, doesn't leave. He stays in his headquarters. Some said he drank. Others said he took opium. But during the next battle, the climactic battle of Bemis Heights, Arnold erupts from his headquarters. He has no official standing in the army, and the battle is raging. He makes his way to the front lines, and even though he has no, no one under him, there are many men in the army that are willing to follow him just about anywhere. Uh, as night is coming, the, the British have been pushed back, and they're in their two, behind two redoubts. The redoubt on the British right, if it falls, this will be it. Arnold sees a way to do it. Uh, there, if, if he can lead a group around the back of the redoubt and go through the entrance known as the Sally Port while other American soldiers attack from the front, they will have done it. Off Arnold goes through two lines of fire, men following it after him. He, he comes through the Sally Port on his horse, his sword upraised and orders the German soldiers inside the redoubt to surrender. A soldier raises his musket, fires, the musket ball hits him in the left thigh, the same leg that had been injured at Quebec. The, it, fra it fractures his thigh bone into fragments and kills his horse that collapses on top of his injured leg. He's lying there as American soldiers swarm into the redoubt. Henry Dearborn, a young New Hampshire officer uh, who was with Arnold in Quebec, comes up to him, first man there, he says, are you badly injured? And he says, in the same same leg. I wish the musket ball had gone through my heart. Because what he realized is, yeah, they, they'd won this, but guess who is going to be the hero of Saratoga? Horatio Gates. Well, he was probably, he might lose his leg. Uh, you know, his career might be over. Uh, Arnold, the, soul, the doctors wanted to cut it off. He refused. Uh, he, he spent four months with his leg in the 18th century equivalent of a medieval torture device, a fracture box, where they basically stuffed the leg and tried to put all the pieces back together. And he was so immobilized for four months, he couldn't even write letters. And he, was, and he brooded. Uh, Lafayette came up to Albany and talked with him. And, and uh, uh, he said that, Arnold said that Gates was the greatest poltroon of the world. And he brooded. And he brooded. Our, uh, uh, the US Congress finally came through with his promotion. But from Arnold's perspective, it was too little, too late. And meanwhile, down, down around Philadelphia, Washington was in trouble. Uh, he had lost Philadelphia. They were and suffering through the terrible winter of Valley Forge. And Congress was beginning to, they said, there were members of Congress, particularly those from New England, were saying, look at the hero of Saratoga and look at Washington. Is it time to change generals? It's known as the Conway Cabal, in which uh, a group of politicians and some army officers thought it, tried to maneuver and, and dislodge Washington. Washington, because of his political genius, was able to squash it like a bug. And he would emerge from that terrible winter stronger than ever. Uh, he would never again be challenged. And, uh, but what Arnold was anything but. He, re he came down to Valley Forge in May. Uh, he, he, it would be uh, a year before he could walk unass unassisted, two years before he could ride a horse. Uh, he, um, you know, he was a very bitter man, but guess what? Because of the great victory at Saratoga, the French have entered the war on a side of America. This changes everything. A colonial uprising has been turned into a world war. The British are forced to consolidate their forces in New York and evacuate, uh, evacuate Philadelphia. This means that Philadelphia, as the British leave, the Philadelphia becomes in Golfed in controversy and turmoil as the patriots who left during the occupation return and are very angry with those that remained. Because he can't function in an active capacity, Washington gives Arnold the position of military governor of Philadelphia. It would have required a general of immense tact to take over this role. This was not Arnold. Soon he was surrounded in controversy, Oh, Joseph Reed, uh, you know, Washington's uh, adjutant general who was disloyal by this time is now the equivalent of the governor, despises Arnold. It's like, you know, it's just awful. It's all falling apart. He's angry, but you know what? He's fallen in love. 
He's a widower at this time with three young children. He, he's 36 years old. He meets 18-year-old Peggy Shippen. Peggy had greatly enjoyed the British occupation of New York. She and her sisters came, uh, came from a very well-to-do uh, Philadelphia family. She, they socialized regularly with the British officers, one of whom, uh, Major John Andre, did a wonderful sketch of her that you can see in, in Valiant Ambition. They get married. Arnold and, and Peggy get married, and within a month, Arnold sends his first feelers to the British, to none other than John Andre, Major John Andre, who will become the British spy chief. Now, it's an incredible tale of espionage that goes for more than a year. It took Arnold a while to come up to convince himself to do it. I'm not going to go into that. That's why you have to buy the book. <laughs> but I will say, let's fast forward to the late summer of 1780. The revolution has cratered. America, it's, Americans have basically turned their back on the promise they made to one another with the Declaration of Independence. They, uh, we, we went into this war because we didn't want to pay taxes to the British. Now, apparently, we do not want to pay the taxes required to fund an army to win us our independence. And Washington's army is withering on the vine. Arnold has decided it's not going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, he gets command at West Point which is now the foremost fort in America, has 3,000 soldiers. His plan is for 10,000 pounds to turn that over to the British. If that succeeded in the end of September of 1780, it would have very probably been the end. But, uh, and once again, you can't make this stuff up. Uh, Arnold, and Was Arnold and Andre have had this correspondence going, but they need to meet one one more time, they need to meet for the first time before they, they, the soldiers have been, British soldiers have been loaded into the ships in New York. They're about, on the next tide, they're going to sail up the Hudson and take for uh, West Point. But first, Andre and, and Andre need to meet on the banks, west bank of the Hudson River. Andre sails up the Hudson in the HMS Vulture. Uh, they meet at midnight in a grove of trees. Arnold gives Andre a packet of documents related to the security of West Point. That spring, unknown to Arnold, one of his officers has taken a cannon to the end of Teller's Point, fires on the vulture, forces it down the river. Andre has lost his way back to New York. That night, he, he, he disguises himself. That night, he's taken across the river. And the next morning, he's making his way through that no man's land I was telling you about in Westchester. I mean, this is the territory of Rip Van Winkle and the Headless Horseman. Through this terrifying no man's land, Andre is making his way to New York. He's within a few miles of safety when out of the shadows come three men with muskets, one of them wearing a Hessian Jaeger jacket. Andre thinks, aha, these have to be British militiamen. British uh, loyalist, and he, he so uh, he's, he, he says, are, are you from the lower part, meaning are you from New York? And they say, yeah, mm -hmm. and he says, great, I am a British officer on very important business, let me pass. They say, get off that horse. Turns out they're American militiamen, and the guy with the Jaeger jacket had been imprisoned in New York just a few days before and used that jacket to escape. They search him. They find the documents in, in the sock, the, the stocking inside his boot. They know he's a spy, but is Arnold in, you know, th these are Arnold's documents, but they don't, it's not clear. So a message is sent to Washington, and a message is sent to Arnold, whose headquarters is about a mile below West Point. And as, and once again, you can't make this up. Okay, so you've got messengers going to Washington and Arnold. Well, guess where Washington is headed? to Arnold's headquarters for breakfast. Arnold, the, Arnold gets the message first. He realizes, uh-oh, they know, they're going to figure this out. By this time, Peggy is at his headquarters. They have, a, they have an infant son. He goes to their upstairs bedroom and says, I'm out of here. He goes down to the dock that in front of his house, jumps on his barge, escapes down the river to the vulture, and makes it to British-occupied New York and will ultimately become a British major, uh, a brigadier general. Hours later, Washington arrives. Hamilton, and, it's, and he's with Hamilton, Lafayette, the young French officer who's like a surrogate son to, to Washington, Henry Knox, 
they get the documents that prove that Arnold, his best general, has betrayed him. Washington turns to Lafayette and says, whom can we trust now? You know, this was, talk about a body blow. And it was a body blow to all of America. This was outrageous that one of our best generals had done this. Arnold would, and this is the great irony, tragic irony of Arnold's life. In the early years of the revolution, no general um, short of Washington did more for the American cause, but it was as a traitor that Arnold lit a fire under the American people when it seemed that all fires had, had, uh, had, had been stopped. He would be burned in effigy uh, in Philadelphia and towns up and down the American seacoast. And uh, he would be, Clinton, who is the, the uh, commanding officer of Britain, would send him down to uh, uh, Virginia, which would begin that winter, which would begin the whole movement of troops that in less than a year's time would, would result in Yorktown and our independence. And it was Arnold that uh, both as a hero and as a traitor that did more than anyone short of Washington to determine the course of the revolution. And I'd like to end by reading just a brief portion of the epilogue that speaks to the impact of Arnold's treason, not only on the revolution, but on our emerging sense of what is America. The United States had been created through an act of disloyalty. No matter how eloquently the Declaration of Independence had attempted to justify the American rebellion, a residual guilt hovered over the circumstances of the country's founding. Arnold changed all that. By threatening to destroy the newly created republic through, ironically, his own betrayal, Arnold gave this nation of traitors the greatest of gifts, a myth of creation. The American people had come to revere George Washington, but a hero alone was not sufficient to bring them together. Now they had the despised villain, Benedict Arnold. They knew both what they were fighting for and against. The story of America's genesis could finally move beyond the break with the mother country and start to focus on the process by which 13 former colonies could become a nation. As Arnold had demonstrated, the real enemy was not Great Britain, but those Americans who sought to undercut their fellow citizens' commitment to one another. Whether it was Joseph Reed's willingness to promote his state's interests at the expense of what was best for the country as a whole, or Arnold's decision to sell his loyalty to the highest bidder, the greatest danger to America's future came from self-serving opportunism masquerading as patriotism. At this fragile stage in the country's development, a way had to be found to strengthen rather than destroy the existing framework of government. The Continental Congress was far from perfect, but it offered a start to what could one day be a great nation. By turning traitor, Arnold had alerted the American people to how close they had all come to betraying the revolution by putting their own interests ahead of their newborn countries. Already, the name Benedict Arnold was becoming a byword for that most hateful of crimes, treason against the people of the United States. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, it's getting a little warm here, but I think we have, we can handle a few questions if that's all right, we have a microphone, we have microphones, so if anyone has a question, uh, I'm having a tr hard time seeing below this. We got a question over there? What could, uh, here's a microphone coming right oh, at you. Thank you. Hi, I had a question for you. Do you believe that the series Turn, Washington Spies is accurate? Oh, uh, the series Turn, well, uh, you know, it came out basically as I was writing this book. And of course, you know, it's, it's, it's the story of the espionage system that Washington put together that uh, had a lot to do with um, the ultimate good result of, of the revolution. Uh, but, you know, I, I realized I, I, I just couldn't go there while I was working on the book. And so I, have, um, I, ha I haven't seen it, but um, I have to say, you know, I think anything 
it's, it's been pretty popular. And, you know, with, with Hamilton, the musical, I just think the changes that have occurred in the last couple of years as far as popular history and history just becoming of interest to, to people and particularly young people has been so great that uh, I applaud it all. Thank you. Uh, could you uh, maybe enlighten us a little bit more about Aaron Burr's early days in, in, as an officer? Did you f uh, pick up on some of his uh, biography in the, uh, as a, a military officer? Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I, I cannot speak with any authority about Aaron Burr, uh, unfortunately. But, you know, what I can say, um, you know, he was there with uh, Arnold in this really amazing uh, journey through the, the wilds of Maine. And then he, he married a, a woman uh, who had, of loyalist leanings, um, who had a conversation with Peggy Shippen uh, after Arnold's treason. And after Arnold's treason, uh, Peggy went into, Peggy was a, was, had a, was a, a volatile, volatile, very bright woman uh, who had a history of hysterical episodes uh, that seemed to occur in con at convenient times. And, um, and as soon as she waited, gave her husband a few hours to escape, she went into one of these hysterical episodes and convinced every American, Hamilton, particularly Hamilton, Hamilton really l spent a lot of time at Peggy's bedside, uh, <laughs> making sure she was okay. Um, and, um, and, you know, she just, and it was assumed in the 19th century uh, that uh, she was innocent, you know, that, that she had been driven temporarily insane by the revelation of her husband's treason. And, um, and Aaron Burr uh, published or was responsible for the, one of the few comments through his wife saying that in her conversation that Peggy, you know, now that I'm talking to a loyalist, oh, oh my gosh, it's been so hard trying to, you know, maintain this. The things I had to do to get Arnold to finally do this, you won't believe. And, you know, basically saying that he, she had stage managed it. And so, because Aaron Burr would be the controversial figure he would ultimately become, it was generally dismissed. But uh, then in the 20th century, uh, Henry Clinton, who was the British commanding officer in America, his papers uh, were donated, were not donated, but were acquired by uh, the, the Clemens Library in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And, you know, these papers had never been taken out of the, the boxes that they had been originally stored in until then. And they included uh, John Andre's spy co espionage correspondence with Arnold. And it's really cool stuff. You know, this is, these are, you know, it's written in, in code. And, and, you know, here's the letter that, you know, Arnold saying, I will surrender uh, for uh, West Point for this amount of money. And, and, and it's in code. And then there's the, the transcription. It's all interesting stuff. But there, once that correspondence was revealed, it became clear that Peggy was very involved in all this. And so uh, it, it gave Aaron Burr a sense, you know, he was long gone, but it, it, it corroborated uh, what he had said. Yes. Let's see. Hi. Yes. Just a question is, when, when you were doing all your research, and so you're reading all of these different accounts, you sound very certain that this was the way it was and this wasn't the way it was. Did you have to sit back and reflect a lot on what you thought was the accurate account? Yeah, well, you know, the writing history is very hard uh, because it all comes down to the evidence. And um, in the case of a, a topic like this, there's all kinds of evidence. And they don't all agree by any means, particularly when it comes to a controversial figure like Arnold, where, uh, where basically the historical re record was rewritten after his treason. And, you know, he, his name was removed from, you know, from everywhere, from the, the, literally the military annals of the United States. Uh, and it became convenient to remember him as a diabolical child, you know, a, a, uh, a, a devil in car, you know, from birth, because that, how else could you explain? I mean, you, it would, you know, no one wanted to think that he could have had his reasons uh, for being upset. And so you, you, it's, it's, 
you know, it's a process of, of looking at that. And, and what amazed me were, were the number of people who, um, who actually served with Arnold um, and despised what he did, but got defended him when people like Horatio Gates dismissed him as a drunkard and a braggart. And, you know, saying, you know, in his little finger is more military ability than you, you know, Mr. Gates kind of thing. And so, um, you know, you have that kind of thing. And, and so the, the, one of the books uh, I did, The Last Stand, about the Battle of Little Bighorn, uh, one of the reasons I was attracted by that topic is that there's just so much different evidence from so many different sources. Native testimony versus army testimony versus you know, civilian test, you know, all of this kind of thing. And so it's this historian's role, I think, is to look at all of the evidence. And yeah, I do spend a lot of time thinking about it. That's why I have a dog. Uh, because uh, it's when I'm walking the dog uh, for an hour to an hour and a half that I do a lot of that, you know, so what do I think really happened? And, um, and not to say, you know, this is my take on it. And it's, but I think you have to have a take on it. Otherwise, you don't really have anything to say. And I think, you know, point of view is absolutely essential when it comes to history. And, but, you know, and that's why history has to be written with every generation, because we all have changing points of view, as uh, particularly in America, where the meaning of the Declaration of Independence, that you know, all men are created equal, ex has expanded with each generation and changed in ways that the founding fathers could have never anticipated. But that's America. And that's what history is about. It's, you know, looking back from a different perspective, but being cautious. You cannot, you know, you cannot the, do the analogy that, you know, well, so your knowledge of the past reveals Get, cast some revelation as to what's happening today? No, I, you know, there's the old saying, you know, if you do not know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. Yeah, I'm afraid we're all doomed to repeat it. You, I don't care how much history you know, when you're in the midst of living life, you don't have any kind of perspective. History is granted to us in hindsight. Without hindsight, none of us, we're, it's, we're in the midst of a chaos that is terrifying, exhilarating, and mortifying. But it's always been that way. It's always been that way. I mean, and you know, it, it changes and all that. You know, Washington and, and Lafayette and Hamilton and all these guys were now, were, you know, they, they were incredible people, but they were, it, they didn't know where it was going. And they weren't always doing it for the right reasons. And I think as an historian, it's for me, it's very important that we try to see all sides of it as we can, but with a point of view. Okay, I think that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Nat. I was listening, and I think you could have heard a pin drop in this room. And I especially appreciate some of your thoughts on today and, and, and history. Um, you know, events like this are indeed the result of partnerships. And I just wanted to say to Joanne, too, that in the book world, people ask me, are, they're jealous of us, of how our relationship with the library. And I'm not making this up either. Um, we had to give a little talk on libraries. And I just said, it's the people. It's the people there. And we'd like to thank you and Lauren Robinson in the back. Thank you, Lauren. Um, and Gail. And Gail Rabbits, uh, who is the president of the Friends of the Sandwich Public Library, for all your support and help. Thank you. And, uh, and of course, we'd also like to, t to thank the town of Sandwich that has made this beautiful auditorium available for us today. Thank you very much. And as special as this night was, we can relive it thanks to the Sandwich Community Television. Hi, Rob, up there filming today. We thank you very much for that. And this will be available if you, as a click from the website at Sandwich Community Television. So tell all your friends who perhaps wasn't, weren't able to come tonight. We'd also like to thank Penguin Publishers who made Nat's visit popular, or per, not popular. I think you made it popular, <laughs> but made it possible. Yes. Um, 
and, and also the staff of Titcomb's Bookshop. I see Elizabeth Merritt here, and Fran Ziegler, Kathy Colvin, and Elizabeth Sturgis. Thank you all. Um, so I, um, I think just to let you know about the, what's going to happen now, uh, we do have books for sale. Nat's going to be, Nat, you're going to be right over there signing. And we, I think you all have a little bookmark. If you don't, you can get one that Elizabeth gave you with numbers. We're going to call the numbers for the signing so you don't have to stay in line a long time. And, um, wow, just like the deli counter. I'm telling you. <laughs> That's innovation. It might be a long, long line. But um, so anyways, we're, we again thank you. Your presence helped make this things, events like this possible as well. Thank you all for coming. And uh, have a good evening.